thank you all. It's quite a diverse group. Everybody's spread all over the place, so I hope you can hear me. Um, and also, if you're in the cheap seats, you may not be able to see all the slides completely, but um, I've tried to make the writing as, as readable for you all back there as possible. So I want to talk a little bit about current um, things that have been coming out from the Obama administration, uh, particularly just in the past month. And I want to talk about its implications for nuclear nonproliferation efforts. But before we get started, I want to show you an example of a slide that you don't want to use in your presentation. I just read in the New York Times that the Department of Defense, particularly the Army, has been really enthralled with PowerPoint. Uh, and so they've kind of taken it to extremes. <laughs> That's supposedly the plan for producing stability in Afghanistan. So um, if you can follow that, uh, more power to you. All right, the whole nuclear security agenda of uh, President Obama is based on two principles that you may think are counterproductive. Uh, it was articulated in a speech uh, last year in Prague. And the first part is to, uh, there we go, try to work to eventually rid the world of nuclear weapons and do so in a way that minimizes the threat from uh, nuclear weapons either in state parties' hands or in terrorist hands. However, at the same time, he believes that we ought to maintain a safe and secure and reliable nuclear force as long as nuclear weapons exist in the world. And we're going to try to talk about how one tries to achieve both um, goals uh, at the same time. Now, these are the key events that have happened in the past month. They're not in chronological order. They're in the order that I'm going to talk about them. But one, uh, I guess I got to go this way, is the New START Treaty, Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty. Oh, by the way, I'm going to define all the acronyms I can, but you can't have a talk on nuclear weapons and nuclear technology and arms control issues without a whole bunch of acronyms. So we'll, we'll go through them. In about a week, the Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty is going to hold a review conference. And most of this, these uh, events have been gearing up toward this review conference. And I want to talk about that in more detail. The nuclear posture review that was just released at the beginning of this month sets out the purpose and the goals for having nuclear weapons in the U.S. arsenal. And I want to go over that in a lot of detail, but we need to do some history before we get to that point. And then finally, in the middle of this month, about a week or so ago, there was a nuclear security summit that was held in Washington, D.C. that talked about securing nuclear material and particularly trying to keep them out of the hands of terrorist organizations. So I want to talk about that and how that sort of helps uh, the nonproliferation goal. All right, some acronyms. All right, sort of the acronym game, okay? Intercontinental ballistic missile. These are the missiles that are land-based that were intended to go from the US to the Soviet Union before it dissolved and now to Russia, long-range land-based missiles. Then we also have missiles on our submarines, so they're called submarine-launched ballistic missiles. The missiles that we have can carry more than one warhead and target more than one target per missile. And so we call that those uh, weapons multiple independently targetable reentry vehicles. Notice we don't call them nuclear weapons, we call them reentry vehicles. They just happen to explode uh, when they hit their target. And then if we lump together, I love this one, missiles and our long range bombers, we have what's called strategic nuclear delivery vehicles. All right. And the reason you use these acronyms is you're just too lazy to write out all these words. So, uh, I'll, re I'll remind you of what those things mean uh, in a little bit. So I want to talk about the START Treaty. 
But in order to understand the New START Treaty, I need to kind of do a little review of what has been done in the realm of nuclear weapons arms control between the U.S. and back then the Soviet Union and now with Russia. So the first treaty that was negotiated uh, was the Strategic Arms Limitation Treaty. We fondly call it SALT. SALT I was the first treaty negotiated between the U.S. and the Soviet Union involving uh, strategic nuclear weapons. And basically it was a freeze. It said this these are the numbers that you can have for the number of missiles in your arsenal. It didn't address bombers, just missiles. And that was a good thing, except the limits hadn't been reached yet, but that was the limits. Also part of it was something called the Anti-Ballistic Missile Treaty, which prevented missile defenses and was part of the arms control landscape until just quite recently when the previous uh, administration decided to leave the anti-ballistic missile treaty and we'll look at some of the consequences of that as well. The name isn't important but every nuclear arms treaty between the US and the Soviets and the US and the Russians have this provision in there. There is a committee of technical experts from both countries that meet periodically to discuss how the treaty is being implemented. No political people, no publicity, it's all out of the limelight, and that's where real progress is made in ensuring these treaties are being uh, established. And so this was the first one that started that process. The major problem with SALT-1 is it did not limit the number of warheads you could have on missiles. And to give you an indication of that, I want to show you this, uh, this chart that shows how nuclear warheads changed from 1970 to 1986. So the U.S. in that time basically tripled the number of warheads that they had in their deployed strategic arsenal from a little over 4,000 to over 12,000. At the same time, the Soviets increased their number of warheads by almost a factor of 20. Now, they were at a, a very uh, extreme disadvantage back in 1970. We thought that they had a lot more than they did, so we ramped up our production. And so they had to do a lot of catch up. And you can see they did a pretty good job of catching up. SALT II was supposed to follow on that and address the number of warheads. Um, this is bombers and missiles. They put a limit on it at 2400, 2250 by 1981, supposedly. There was a very complicated formula of how many warheads you could have on what missiles, combinations of warheads on land base and subs, adding cruise missiles. It was just a really detailed formula uh, of how these warheads could be distributed. It was never ratified. Anybody know why? What happened toward the end of the 70s? The Soviets invaded Afghanistan. And we decided we were going to oppose that. We didn't like the idea that uh, we would reward them with a treaty if they were taking actions that we didn't agree with. So the treaty was brought off the table, never ratified. Uh, but both countries agreed to abide by it until the Reagan administration. Now this really doesn't involve strategic warheads. It's called the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. But it really is an important treaty and I want to try to make that case. It involved the elimination of medium range that less than 3,000 kilometers and short range missiles that were uh, deployed around Eastern and Western Europe uh, by the Soviet Union and the United States and NATO forces. It was an important treaty because one, this time frame, we're talking about um, the nuclear freeze movement, we're talking about movies like The Day After, uh, President Reagan's uh, policy of fighting and winning a protracted nuclear war, scaring a lot of people, the neutron bomb being deployed in Europe, all of these things uh, were raising the the concerns of the population in U.S. and uh, 
Europe. So it had a very big psychological impact that we were able to sign a treaty with the Soviet Union. It called for reductions. First time any kind of nuclear weapons was reduced. And it was asymmetric. The Soviets had to reduce a lot more weapons than the US did. So this was, now you didn't have to say, you get rid of five, we'll get rid of five. We just eliminated a whole bunch of different uh, systems. The first time the Soviet Union agreed to on-site inspections. Up until that point, any time you mention on-site inspections, the Soviets would say we could no longer negotiate this treaty. In fact, there was an organization developed in the United States called the On-Site Inspection Agency, whose primary goal was to verify that these weapons were being eliminated uh, throughout Europe and uh, in the Soviet Union. It described how you eliminate nuclear weapons. You take the warheads off the missiles, you dismantle the warheads, take the plutonium or high enriched uranium and store it somewhere, and then you destroy the missiles. So it described how that process would work. And if it wasn't for the success of this treaty, we wouldn't be having any more strategic arms reduction treaty. So because this treaty was successful, it was verified, both countries were happy with what happened, we got the start process. This was called strategic arms, um, uh, that should be re reduction treaty, I'm sorry, there's a typo. Reductions, actually reduce the number of weapons. 1,600 missiles and bombers by both sides, no more than 6,000 warheads by each side. Um, now it's hard to count warheads because you have to inspect them, right? So. Um, if you tested a missile that could hold three warheads, that missile was counted as having three warheads, whether it had two or one or whatever. So it would help with the verification. Uh, bombers that carried bombs, you didn't really know how many bombs were in there, so that had its own little counting scheme. But 6,000 weapons. Now from 12,000 to 6,000, that uh, sounds like a large reduction until you figure out what are you going to do with 6,000 nuclear weapons each. Uh, there were limits on how many you could have on what system and so on, the same kind of counting rules. On-site inspections, and it expired last year, December of 09. And when that expired, there was, and there still is, no ratified strategic nuclear weapons treaty between the US and Russia that has verification provisions in it. So this is an important reason why this new START treaty was being negotiated. Because of the success of the INF treaty and the end of the Cold War, it was realized that we could get lower. And so this, um, a number of measures were done. First of all, unilaterally, uh, George Herbert Walker Bush removed just about all tactical nuclear weapons um, from around the country, took them all off surface ships, attack submarines, Navy planes, uh, removed all tactical, that's short range, nuclear weapons from South Korea, all missiles and artillery shells and everything from Europe. Right now we only have about 200 tactical bombs uh, deployed in five different countries in Europe as part of NATO. NATO was supposed to be meeting in the next year or so to decide whether or not they want to keep that nuclear option available. Russia agreed to do the same thing. <clears throat> but since these are unilateral actions, there's no verification. And so we were never sure the Russians were really doing this and we were never really sure they knew how many tactical nuclear weapons they had and how secure they were. So, but this is a unilateral action trying to reduce the number of weapons and possibly the threat from them. So we had a second START agreement that reduced the number of warheads even further down to about 3,000 by, supposed to be by December of 2007. And again, that strategic 
nuclear delivery vehicle, mi all kinds of missiles and long-range bombers. If we are going to eliminate bombers or missiles, they had to be deactivated. That means their weapons would be taken off of them and put in storage, and then the system would be destroyed, or the silo would be filled up, or something along those lines. So not only are you reducing them, but you're getting rid of them, so it's be harder to get back up when the treaty ended. No multiple warheads on ICBMs. All right. Why is that important? Well, you have two countries. Both countries have 100 ICBMs. But each ICBM can carry 10 warheads and target 10 different ICBMs in their silos. And remember how deterrence works. Um, basically, if you attack me and destroy some of my weapon capability, I need to feel I have enough left so I can completely destroy you so you wouldn't launch the first strike in the first place. Kind of convoluted lo logic. But then you have to feel the same thing about your systems and an attack from me. But now you have ICBMs, 10 warheads each, so a small fraction of your arsenal could destroy most of mine. And then I would have a decision to make. Do I launch my remaining 10 or 15 missiles to destroy your country, and you have 80 of them left, and you could completely destroy my country? Um, it's bad for deterrence. So this whole idea of the START II treaty, putting one warhead on one ICBM, was good for stability, good for deterrence. Oh, um, one other thing. The U.S. ratified this right away. The Russians had trouble ratifying it because little things like what was going on in Kosovo or the invasion of Iraq, um, it was hard for the Duma to ratify it. Uh, and then when um, the last administration decided to drop out of the ABM treaty, the Russians said START II is no longer valid. So, that was a nice idea, but it never flew. And in fact, uh, the Clinton administration agreed that we could go even lower. So there was a framework for Star 3 that never got signed to go down to 2,000 or 2,500. And the Russians said, hey, let's go down to 1,500. And that 1,500 number shows up again in a little bit. Um, obviously, that went nowhere. New administration. So we have the Street Strategic Offensive Reductions Treaty, SORT, all right? It's better known as the Moscow Treaty. And so it commits the U.S. and Russia to reduce their deployed strategic nuclear forces to somewhere between 2,200 and 1,700. And it was up to you how you wanted to distribute those warheads. Now there's some major differences. These are deployed weapons, but you could keep a bunch in the closet. And there was really no limit on how many you could keep there and redeploy at some future date if you needed to. No verification. Okay. No verification. It was just taking your word for it that you were doing it. And even more interesting, it was supposed to come into force on December 13th, 2012, and that's the day the treaty ended. I'll let you think about that for a little bit, okay? So you reduce the number of weapons down to 1,700, and the treaty's over, and then you can do whatever you want. Okay. So that's the climate that the new administration has come into, particularly the fact that the old START I treaty um, had ended in December, there was a lot of uh, impetus to try to negotiate a follow-on to that. By the way, forgot to show you this. This is the START Treaty, okay? This is the treaty. The verification is incredibly complex. It tells you how many people you can have in your inspection party. It tells you what kind of 
how many measuring tapes you can have. It gives you the make and model of the measuring tapes. It gives you, tells you how many cameras you can have, how many packs of film you can have when you go there. If you want to take a picture, your guide has to point the camera and then you click it and then they take two pictures, one for the guide and one for you and the inspection party. Very complicated and very expensive. So that was another concern. So we have a new treaty that was just announced in, I think, beginning of April. And I'm very disappointed in the Obama administration because we don't have a new acronym. <laughs> it's called the New START. Uh, they could have come up with something better than that, I think. Um, remember that number 1,500? Well, here it is, 1,550 warheads. Both sides are committed to have 800 missiles and bombers. Your pick on how you want to distribute them. 700 of them can be deployed at any one time. So the others could be for training or um, other missions instead of strategic nuclear weapons and so on. The verification builds on what the START treaty was but it simplifies it so that it's much less uh, expensive and complicated. So the treaty is only about uh, 10 pages long instead of this whole type of thing. But it allows for on-site inspections. You exchange data back and forth. You determine if, you know, if there's discrepancies and then you make inspections to make sure that they're saying what they, they have, what they really say they have. Uh, if you conduct a missile test, um, whenever anybody conducts a missile test of a new system, for example, you send back radio signals that um, tell you what the performance of the missile is during the test flight, called telemetry. Um, the treaty says that you cannot encode the telemetry, that both countries get to see the information from the test flight to, to determine capabilities of your uh, weapon systems. Whenever the treaty is ratified, um, the limits come into play seven years from that date. And it will last for at least 10 years or longer if the parties decide. And what the hope is, this was sort of done very quickly to get a treaty in place, but the hope is that further negotiations can put, um, I don't know if it's going to be the new, new start or whatever it's going to be called. No limits on missile defenses. So the U.S. can work on their missile defense system. Um, so the START Treaty doesn't address that. Although the Russians put out a statement with the treaty that said there is an intimate relationship between missile defenses and offensive systems. If you believe in deterrence, and if the other side strikes first and destroys a certain percentage of your arsenal, then, uh, then that country's missile defense would be more effective against a smaller attack than a larger attack. And that's what the Russians wanted to get into the treaty, so any further reductions, I think, is going to be a little more complicated. However, you can still keep warheads in reserve. So the statement made by the Obama administration is if the circumstances change, they could get back up to two to three thousand if they had to. So there's some good things and some not so good things. All right, that's a START treaty. And so this is a comparison of the, all the different treaties. I think the interesting thing is to note that um, the number of warheads have been decreasing from 6,000 now down to, the laser's not working very well there, down to about 1,500. So the movement is in the right direction. The number of missiles and bombers has decreased significantly as well, down to about 700. So, um, so that's the one leg. All right, so all you MPT freaks out here, here we go. The Nuclear Nonproliferation Treaty. What is nuclear nonproliferation? Well, we're trying to prevent countries from developing nuclear weapons. So how do you do that? 
Well, the most difficult part in building a nuclear weapon is obtaining the fuel. And that's not as easy as it seems. The problem is, and the way you need to stem this, is realize that when you build the technology to make fuel for a commercial reactor, it's the exact same technology you would use to make fuel for a nuclear device. And so you need to control that in some way. All right, those of you who have taken my IDS course have seen this slide before. Um, when you take uranium out of the ground, there's two isotopes. Uranium-238, which is the most prevalent, and about 0.7% of it is an isotope of uranium, uranium-235. They have the same chemical properties, but it's the uranium-235 that undergoes the fission in a reaction in a reactor that releases the energy and it's the fuel that you want to use in a nuclear device. Now if you build a reactor and you use water as a coolant, natural uranium won't work. You need to increase the amount of uranium-235. And if you do so to 3 to 5 percent uranium-235 from 0.7 percent, that's called low enriched uranium. That's what you use in a nuclear reactor. But you just keep enriching it, and instead of going from 0.7 to 3 to 5 percent, you go from 3 to 5 to 80 to 95 percent. Now you have weapons grade uranium, or what we call highly enriched uranium. This is the enrichment technique. Yes, sir? Just a quick question. Is there a minimum enrichment value that will get you a nuclear weapon? It has to, in order to get a critical mass, it has to be at least larger than 20%, but then the size of the weapon would be huge. But yeah, you can do it from 20% on, but the higher the enrichment, the smaller the weapon that you can build. So this is. Since they're the same chemically, the way you take uranium-235 out of uranium-238 is you form a gas, uranium hexafluoride, and you put it into a centrifuge and you spin it around. And all you physics people know that the heavier stuff's going to go to the outside, the lighter stuff was going to go to the center. So those molecules of uranium hexafluoride that contains uranium-235 are going to be more prevalent in the center and those that contain uranium-238 are going to be more prevalent on the outside. So you, subtract, you extract it from the center and you move it to the next one and to the next one and to the next one until you have enough uh, enrichment so you can make reactor fuel out of it. It's not an easy technology. It spins around at several thousand RPM so it has to be made to high tolerance so it doesn't um, kind of spin itself apart. And it's not necessarily easy to make uranium hexafluoride, but it can be done. But you need more than one centrifuge. And so this is a cascade that you would use to produce uranium enriched to 235 for fuel for a uh, uh, reactor. This happens to be the picture of the prototype of the Iranian centrifuge system. And since we're on that topic, there's Ahmadinejad going around looking at his uh, centrifuges. The other fuel that you need is called plutonium. So if you're in a reactor, we said the fuel is 3 to 5 percent uranium-235. That means most of it's uranium-238. That doesn't undergo fission, but what it does in a reactor is a lot of neutrons flying around. It picks one up and eventually changes into plutonium-239, which is going to be around for a while. It has a half-life of 24,000 years. And since it's different than uranium, you can use chemical processes to extract the plutonium. Now France is doing this, Japan is doing this, 
and you can take the plutonium and mix it with uranium called mixed oxide fuels and then you can burn it in a reactor. But again, you can take that plutonium and you can get enough of it and you can make a nuclear device. So the same technologies have to be monitored if you want to try to prevent countries from developing that. Why do you want to worry about nuclear proliferation? I mean, a lot of people say, hey, we, the U.S. and the Soviets never had a major war because they had nuclear weapons. So if we give everybody nuclear weapons, there won't be any major wars. I mean, reasonable argument, I think. I have some concerns. It takes an awful large amount of money to develop the technology to build nuclear weapons. And if resources are scarce, then the countries that develop that may not have enough resources left to worry about command and control and safety of the nuclear devices. The US and the Soviet Union and Russia have spent a lot of money ensuring that the weapons cannot be used accidentally, that there are all sorts of sophisticated codes in there, all sorts of early warning systems to try to prevent. And we even, even with all that, we've come close a couple times. So uh, if a country doesn't have those resources, I think the chances of something uh, going awry is larger than that. There are a number of countries that have a history of bitter disputes with their neighbors. Luckily, the U.S. has been very isolated, uh, so we haven't had that problem. But you think uh, India and China, India and Pakistan, the Middle East. You worry about internal problems. I mean, we've we freaked out over what happened in Pakistan a couple times, a couple different military coups. We worry about their nuclear weapons because of unrest internally. Um, that is a concern to worry about proliferation. And terrorism is becoming obviously one of the major concerns of the U.S. The more nuclear weapons and nuclear material in the world, the larger the chance that a terrorist organization could get its hands on a weapon or the fuel. So if you want to prevent a country from developing nukes, you've got to address the reasons for doing so. Obviously, security is important. So if you can provide them with some sort of security, they may not feel the need to develop nuclear weapons. You get to be members of the nuclear club. Okay, and there's only a few countries that are, so you've got instant prestige associated with that. That's kind of harder to address. You have an amazing advanced technology base if you've mastered uh, enrichment techniques and so on. So uh, you really increase your scientific and engineering capability by developing such a program. And if you can make your own fuel for a reactor, you don't need to rely on someone else supplying that fuel for you. Now that's a different talk about a nuclear fuel bank, but that's one reason to address it. This is the principal legal barrier to prevent nuclear proliferation. It's called the Nuclear Non-Proliferation Treaty. And it's designed to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons. It was opened for signature in 1968, entered in force in 1970. There are currently 186 or 185 countries that are members. It depends how you count North Korea. North Korea wants it both ways, and everyone else in the treaty thinks it's still a member, so um, that number can fluctuate. In 1970, there were five countries that had tested nuclear devices. And so the treaty reflects that. And they're called the nuclear weapon states. United States, Russia now, Back then it was the Soviet Union, England, France, and China. So in the treaty, they're designated as nuclear weapon states, and they have some special obligations. Any other country that joins the treaty must do so as a non-nuclear weapon state. And they agree not to develop nuclear weapons, and the nuclear weapon states agree not to share that technology with the non-nuclear weapon states. 
We heard this from Tim. It was made permanent in 1995. When the treaty first came into force, they said it's going to last for 25 years and then we're going to meet to figure out what to do. And the country that insisted on the 25-year limit the first time was Italy. <laughs> okay. Their feeling was, we don't know what the security situation is going to be in 25 years. Let's not lock ourselves in. So Italy was the one who came up with this. There are three pillars, <laughs> okay, Mark, don't, to the Nonproliferation Treaty. There are obligations on all parties. First of all, the non-nuclear weapon states are guaranteed access to nuclear technology. Could be nuclear reactors, it could be research reactors, it could be cancer treatment therapy units, uh, could be research on eradicating uh, certain insect pests with radiation, could be training medical people, all that they have access to. And particularly those countries that are developing countries should get some kind of financial support to assist with that. To make sure that technology isn't being uh, misused, the countries agree to undergo inspections by the International Atomic Energy Agency, so-called safeguards inspections. And they're there to ensure that the countries uh, are not misusing the material or technology to develop nuclear weapons. Now that kind of gives some kind of regional security because now if your neighbor is being inspected you know that uh, your neighbor is not developing nuclear weapons. The nuclear weapon states are obligated to proceed uh, to work toward nuclear disarmament. Initially it was to end the arms race and then to work toward complete nuclear and total disarmament. So there's an obligation on the nuclear weapon states to work that way. Every five years there's a review conference and you divide the review conference into three committees, one on disarmament, one on safeguards, one on nuclear technology. And then you try to uh, agree on how the treaty has performed and suggestions for the future. And then you try to get a final document. It ha must be agreed to by consensus, which means one country can object and not get a final document. And in the five years, periods that we've had, only three times have we've gotten a final document. Even the year that the, the Nonproliferation Treaty was made permanent in 1995, no final document. Particularly Iran was complaining of access to nuclear technology. What do the nuclear weapon states, non-nuclear weapon states want from the nuclear weapon states? And this goes to what Obama is trying to achieve. Um, in the 2000 document there were 13 steps that were agreed to by everybody including the nuclear weapon states on what they needed to do to strengthen the treaty. Um, outside of that the first thing non-nuclear weapon states want to make sure they have access to technology. But now for the nuclear weapon states they want a comprehensive test ban treaty preventing nuclear testing. The U.S. has signed it. Um, when it went for ratification, the Senate voted it down back in 96, 97, um, after one day of hearings or debate, um, not even hearings, just debate, um, voted it down. But the U.S., by law, is obligated not to test nuclear weapons. So we're still abiding by it, even though we haven't ratified it yet. Trying to negotiate a treaty that would prevent the production of high enriched uranium and plutonium for nuclear weapons. That's what a fissile material cutoff treaty is. So the non-nuclear weapon states would love to see that. When the non-nuclear weapon states talk about disarmament, they want a process that's transparent so everybody knows what's happening, that's verifiable and irreversible. No more nuclear weapons in the closet you can bring out when you need them. When you reduce the number to 1,500, that number is 1,500. When you go lower, that number is really that number. And security assurances. All right. 
These are from 1995, and you can kind of read it, but I'll go over it. Two kinds of security assurances. One is positive security assurance. If you're a non-nuclear weapon state and you're threatened by a nuclear weapon state or someone uses nuclear weapons against you, we will go to your aid. And every, every nuclear weapon state has a positive security assurance. The prob problematic one is a negative security assurance. That means if you're a nuclear weapon state, we won't use nuclear weapons against you. And in 1995, we kind of clarified it. They said, we won't use it against you as long as you're not an ally with the nuclear weapon states that are attacking us. Then you're fair game. But other than that, we won't use nuclear weapons against you. And in fact, we felt so strongly about it in 1995. Gee, what was happening? They are trying to make the MPT permanent. Of course, we are going to say that. We actually have a Security Council resolution. Uh, 984, which codified our negative security assurances, but the non-nuclear non weapon states would like a legal, legally binding treaty to do that. We have always been vague on this, which has been a problem for nuclear weapon states, and I need to kind of go through. 1994, in the, the nuclear posture review that the Clinton administration decided to um, undergo because of the end of the Cold War. They didn't definitely link nuclear weapons with weapons of mass destruction, but they kind of hinted at it. And so this is the first time where the line is being a little cloudy. Up until now, nuclear weapons have always been used to deter nuclear weapons attack. I won't go through the next one. The 2002 posture review, which was mandated by Congress, said we need to get rid of the old triad of bombers, subs, and ICBMs and make it one part of two other things that included active and passive defenses. Well, we know what a passive defense is. Active defenses, you heard the term preemptive war. That's where that kind of comes into that process. But explicitly, it said nuclear weapons would be used to deter attack by weapons of mass destruction, chemical and biological. Now, there's one, you know, one argument can be made, we only have nuclear weapons because there's nuclear weapons that exist in the world. And so, we're working toward it, you don't need to develop nukes. The other argument is, we have nuclear weapons and we're deterring against everything, but you still don't need it. So, it's a harder case to make. Um, so now we come to what I really wanted to cover, and I can do this rather quickly. NPR is not National Public Radio. It's the Nuclear Posture Review, and just released again in April. Preventing Nuclear Proliferation, proliferation and Terrorism, Reducing the Role of Nuclear Weapons in Our Security. Maintaining deterrence, but at a much lower level. Reassuring our allies that we'll still protect them, even though the number of weapons are going down. And, but again, as long as we have nukes, they better be reliable and um, secure. So let me just highlight some of this. We've now introduced a new negative security assurance and said, if you're a member of the Non-Proliferation Treaty and you're not in violation of your obligations, like Iran and North Korea, um, we will not attack you with nuclear weapons. That's the simplest statement of a negative security assurance that you can think of. All right? And if you go around and look at the members of the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the non-nuclear weapon states that are in compliance, it's kind of hard to find countries that we'd want to use nuclear weapons again, against anyway. So I'm, I'm not, I don't think that's really saying an awful lot. The Obama administration wants to keep the triad, but now we're going to take, this is demurred, I love that word, just all ICBMs are just going to have one warhead. We're just going to get rid of multiple warheads. Here's our policy. Right now, all the ICBMs and subs have targets programmed into them. The targets are programmed so that they would, if they were launched right now, they would go 
into the middle of the ocean. And so that's our policy and the Russians have claimed that's their policy as well. There's no way of knowing that, but that's what we say. They want to further strengthen command and control so the president has lots of time before he or she has to make a decision to launch nuclear weapons. Um, spend money in trying to figure out safer ways of housing the ICBMs. That's not particularly important. Retain our capability to move nuclear weapons to a forward base if we needed to. Okay. It's, you know, there's just reducing nuclear weapons, increasing reliance. It's a little of both. All our bombers have been unloaded from nuclear weapons, so they're not on alert. Now, I just said that all our ICBMs and sub-missiles are targeted on the open ocean. However, there's more than one target set in the missile. And within a period of a half hour, you can change one target set to another. And so, right now, we are on a half hour alert with those missiles. So we could easily change them and use them if we had to. That's not a lot of time for cooler heads to prevail. And then we want to increase funding to our weapons labs. We want to uh, look at our nuclear weapons and try to extend their lifetime. That's what the life extension program is. And initially they said, we're not even going to think about designing a new type of nuclear weapon. Well, now it's kind of hedging a little bit. Looking to reintroduce the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty for uh, ratification, negotiations on the Fissile Material Convention, and so on. I just want to highlight this thing real quick and then um, the Security Summit, all these heads of state and other representatives of countries uh, endorsed Obama's goal of securing all nuclear material. Now these aren't weapons, this is just material that could be used for weapons in four years. Um, try to get some international response to incidents of illicit nuclear traffic trafficking. There's all sorts of reports of people trying to smuggle high enriched uranium, uh, sell it on the black market, those kinds of things. Um, in the Atoms for Peace program, we, uh, in the 50s, we decided countries needed research reactors and we pushed them all around the globe. Now you don't want to have to keep refueling research reactors, so the fuel for them is high enriched uranium, weapons grade uranium. And so they're located all over the world. And so the push is on to convert those from using high enriched uranium to low enriched uranium. And then countries that have the money pledged assistance to those that might need it to introduce these reforms. That's a metric ton, by the way. That's why it's spelled a little differently. But that's how much high enriched uranium and plutonium exist in the world today. I don't know, I, you can do a quick calculation, 60,000 nuclear weapons you can make with that stuff. To date, the US has been making a major effort We've gone to 47 facilities around the, the world and removed all their high enriched uranium, sometimes in the dead of night, very clandestinely, so other people don't know what we're doing, but we've removed it and taken it back or exchanged it for light enriched uranium for the research reactors. Russia has declared 500 metric tons of high enriched uranium as excess, and so the U.S. had a program with them. If you take the high enriched uranium, mix it with natural uranium to produce low enriched uranium for reactor fuel, we'll buy it from you. And it's an $8 billion program and it runs out in 2013. We generate 20% of our nuclear energy from nuclear power reactors. Half of that, 10% comes from former material for weapons in the Soviet Union. So 10% of the light that you see right here is coming from old nuclear weapons material that was targeted against us during the Cold War. Kind of interesting thing to think about. 
The U.S. has done the same thing, about 175 metric tons. And just last week, the U.S. and Russia has finally agreed that we'll take 35 tons of excess plutonium and try to figure out a way to get rid of it, make it into reactor fuel so we could burn it in a reactor. I'm, I know you're happy to see that slide. It's clear to me that the timing and the structure of the START Treaty, the Posture Review, and the Security Summit was all geared for the MPT Review Conference. And it's all trying to get a positive outcome. All right, 2000, we had a final document. Everybody agreed on the 13 steps. 2005 was a disaster. All right, the U.S. said we don't agree to any of those 13 steps anymore. The, the climate has changed because of 9-11, and all the U.S. was wanting to do during this meeting was focus on Iran and North Korea. They wouldn't negotiate or talk about anything else. The meeting broke up. Um, everybody was unhappy with it. There was a lot of concern that the nonproliferation treaty isn't going to last anymore. It's sort of, you know, gone by the wayside. The U.S. isn't serious. And so the Obama administration is really making a push to try to get a positive outcome. I'm not sure it will happen, but at least that's what the structure is. And I think the, 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 the nuclear posture review, which it has some reductions, but also some increases and sort of ambivalent on how to deal with nuclear weapons, is particularly aimed at the Senate so that the START Treaty could get ratified to show that the Obama administration isn't weak in terms of na national defense. We're still strengthening and securing our weapons um, and trying to get the START Treaty ratified. And how low we can go depends on whether or not we get the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty ratified and whether or not we get negotiations on a cutoff treaty. Thanks for your attention. <laughs>